we are live. Great. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Tim Briglin, the chair of the House Energy and Technology Committee. It is Wednesday morning, April 28th. This is our nine o'clock hearing. And um, this morning, in recent weeks, we've been doing this work on Thursday mornings. Today, we're um, doing it on Wednesday morning. We're going to be um, turning back to this committee's work on artificial intelligence and um, automated decision systems. Um, we, we're going to have two hearings this morning, and our first hearing is going to be a little more focused on um, issues related to privacy, um, which is relatively new uh, to this committee on the, um, on the AI and automated decision systems front. And um, we have three guests this morning, um, Sarah Jordan from the Future of Privacy Forum, um, who's calling in from Northern Virginia. And then we have two guests from, uh, from the Attorney General's office, Charity Clark and Ryan Grieger. And um, again, wanna welcome you all uh, here. Thanks for being with us. I re really appreciate your time. Um, we're gonna turn first to, uh, to Sarah Jordan. And um, Sarah, I understand that you, there are some documents that I think are posted to our website. So for committee members, as well as um, for folks who might be listening in the public, if you go to our committee's website under today's date, um, you can find documents um, that are listed there. So um, Sarah, why don't we um, rely on everybody to pull that uh, document up on their own. And if we have difficulties, then we can screen share. Um, so we'll go from there. But anyway, welcome, Sarah. Thank you for being with us this morning. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all this morning. Good morning, representatives and members of the public. Um, I'm Dr. Sarah Jordan, Senior Counsel in AI and Ethics at the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, FPF, Future of Privacy Forum, is a nonprofit dedicated to supporting consumer privacy leadership and scholarship. Our mission is to advance principal data practices in support of emerging technologies. First, I'd like to really take the oppor this opportunity to commend um, you all as the legislature in this uh, this organization for your continued attention on issues of artificial intelligence, which is a truly important issue of significant concern for privacy, data protection, and civil rights. As you may know, Vermont is not alone in considering this issue. Automated decision systems legislation is also being actively considered in California, Colorado, New York, New Jersey, Washington State, and Maryland. In addition, the Federal Trade Commission has decades of experience enforcing the FTC Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and the Equal Credit Opportunities Act in the context of automated decision-making. Overseas, the European Commission recently unveiled an extensive proposal to regulate AI. Given this broader context, today I'd like to offer some general observations and reg recommendations about regulation in this arena, which I hope will be truly helpful to you as you consider how to move forward with AI policy. As a general matter, it's crucial that any measures adopted serve to increase transparency and accountability without overburdening vendors or legislators or oversight bodies or creating compliance barriers for new technology. As we see it, there are at least four key areas of opportunities for legislators across the US to clarify and improve the technical and conceptual expectations incorporated into current AI and automated decision system legislation. One, Truly clarifying the, the definition of automated decision-making systems of concern, clarifying its relationship to artificial intelligence, for example. Attending to the needs of the many audiences to artificial intelligence and automated decision systems, ensuring an appropriate timeline and resources for complete compliance, and including appropriate provisions to mitigate unintended consequences. So let me start here a little bit on um, point one. Clarify, clearly defining automated decision systems, systems of concern. ADS, automated decision systems or algorithmic decision systems or algorithmic decision support systems, there's many permutations of this, are part of the fabric of our daily lives, whether used to reroute internet traffic due to unexpected surges and data flows or used in situations that materially impact a person, such as when they're used to grade students' tests or diagnose health conditions. It's important for regulation to focus on those areas which present a heightened risk of harm to natural persons and to avoid overbroad or vague definitions of ADSs. Appropriately defining what's considered to be an ADS or an algorithmic or automated decision system is an important step 
for designing implementable regulation and oversight, clarifying which ADS influence decision making in an adverse, discriminatory, or harmful way is also an imperative part of this, particularly for regulations that invoke a tiered method for ranking which systems will need to go through different forms, say self-assessment or third-party assessment of review or different systems of scrutiny, it's essential that the legislature, legislators define ADS in ways appreciable by systems engineers, the public, and legislators themselves. A key component to be clarified in legislative efforts to define ADSs is the definition of automated decision making that accounts for the wide range of tools used to create the outputs of automated systems. In particular, legislators should be cautious to define algorithmic or automated decision systems with respect to techniques used to manipulate data that arrive at a decision, whether or not that's through statistical modeling, artificial intelligence or machine learning that produces a score, classification or recommendation, or any other simplified output that's designed to support or replace automated decision-making through automated extraction of data. As a part of our efforts at FPF to educate policymakers like you, on the various types of AI machine learning that make up the automation in many, but not all, automated decision systems, we built an infographic, which all of you have had to hand um, uh, already. This infographic, the spectrum of artificial intelligence, shows the many forms of artificial intelligence that are used in decision systems deployed by governments and private firms today. We shared this infographic with you, and I'm happy to take any questions about this, after the conclusion of this more formal testimony. However, in order to be able to situate ADS in the context of this, it's probably best to realize that many automated decision systems rely on methods of data analysis that do not fit visions of extraordinarily complex, inexplicable artificial intelligence as perpetuated in the AI hype cycle that we see in the news today. In most cases, it is explicable forms of AI that are used rather than more opaque, say machine learning or neural network based um, examples. Rules based or symbolic AI, which knits together logical if then statements to determine whether a combination of data points meets a decision threshold is an often used and explicable way of uh, determining how a decision could be made. Knowledge engineering, which creates a network map of pathways between documents and their components to help us understand complex regulatory instruments like tax codes can be explained by computer scientists in much the same way that social network analysis could also be explained by social scientists. Natural language processing that helps consumers navigate websites through interfaces like chatbots may be powered by extremely large language models, but many are not. In fact, Commonplace natural language processing techniques such as dictionary-based search or question and answer wizards are behind many of the systems, say, which stand behind unemployment office, chatbots, or even vaccine finders. Machine learning, which is used to build recommender systems, which help customers find products that fit their preferences, often lean on machine learning that uh, employs regression techniques readily understood by legislators and economists alike. Even image processing, powered by neural networks can be explained through the use of saliency maps. The primary challenge then for legislators striving to understand the techniques of automated interpretation of data incorporated in ADS and algorithmic systems is to grasp really the landscape of possibilities and the vocabulary. We really hope that the infographic we've provided and the associated white paper also provided will help you to accomplish these goals of learning more about the techniques and technologies that stand behind the automation and automated decision systems. Automated decision systems, as we pointed out, are pervasive, and thus there are many audiences to this. So our second point is that we truly need to attend to the needs of the audiences to ADSs when we're trying to define oversight measures for these. What each of the, what each of the audiences, whether or not individuals, groups, offices or organizations need from ADS evaluation is comprehensible information, which allows them to understand when automated decision systems make decisions that affect them, how to understand how their data is used in these systems, data processing, and how to appreciate how they might take action to protect themselves or others from any adverse effects that ADS introduces into their lives. Effective legislation, 
will need to address the information needs of these multiple audiences of users and subjects of ADS systems. In January of 2021, as you may well know, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST, offered guidance on explainability in artificial intelligence that may be truly useful to help states as you craft the criteria for impact assessments, one of the potential oversight tools proposed, which will be useful for the multiple audiences to automated decision systems using AI and similar technology. NIST guidelines suggest four principles for explanation. One, that systems should offer accompanying evidence or reasons for outputs. Two, systems should provide explanations that are understandable to individual users. Three, the explanation given should correctly reflect the system's process for generating the output. And four, the system should only operate under conditions for which it was designed or when the system reaches a sufficient confidence in its output. These principles could be met through any number of mechanisms within, say, an impact assessment framework, but these constitute an effective baseline for the components that ADS or AI impact assessment tools must encompass to meet regulatory goals. But as pointed out at the beginning of this presentation, we need to ensure that there's appropriate timeline and resources for compliance. Proposed legislation, such as presently considered in Vermont and elsewhere, suggest wide ranges of tools and timelines for implementation of oversight of automated decision systems. Some bills already assume that ADS in use by government, private actors, and other public-private partnerships have been appropriately documented, characterized, versioned, and cataloged in locations that are easily accessible by those persons who are accountable for submitting oversight documents like impact assessments. However, the complexity of these systems themselves and the lack of prior requirements for tracking automated decision systems development, design, and deployment, whether in contracts or in other procurement decisions, means that some organizations may not readily have access to technical documentation for their systems in use, and thus may not be able to readily comply. Government offices and vendors to governments may not be aware that the systems that they use every day to improve throughput, to in extract efficiencies, or to create more effective program monitoring really fall under the definitions of some of the ADSs as proposed in current legislation. Governmental organizations in particular may not realize that they're using algorithmic or automated decision systems that are provided as a part of a package of services provided by vendors. Also, government offices may suffer from rather siloed procurement and, or development strategies and may not realize that they've built or developed overlapping ADS systems that have codependencies that will create challenges for help for creating oversight and mechanisms for both or all of the offices using them. Thus, ensuring that ADS legislation is robust to the somewhat messy reality of documenting ADS in government or private business, including identifying those dependencies, will require legislation to attend to supportive mechanisms, such as provisions of time for expert personnel. A fourth point is that we must include appropriate provisions to mitigate unintended consequences. Many of the proposed bills envision a new or expanded oversight office with the responsibility to design and review organizations' compliance with the expectations penned in ADS legislation. Creating or expanding these offices will present states with some challenges, including identifying and attracting appropriately qualified personnel. These personnel needed for these offices must be able to meaningfully interpret algorithmic impact assessments, and they will need to do so in an environment of high sensitivity privacy concerns, publicity, and technological change. As observed in many of the state and federal bills calling for STEM and AI workforce development, the talent pipeline is limited and legislators should address the challenges of attracting qualified personnel as a key component. Finally, protecting the public from adverse decisions by automated decision systems may perversely raise privacy and security risks. Bills requiring handos, handovers of training, test, or validation data, or which require the making public of source code for each of these systems may advertently open up opportunities for data breaches, exfiltration of intellectual property, or even attacks on the algorithmic systems, which could in turn provide harm and harmful situations for individuals who are interacting with those systems. As state bills progress, 
we would encourage deep collaboration with privacy engineers, privacy professionals, data protection officers, cybersecurity, and IP lawyers in order to ensure that these assessments will not produce unforeseen perverse risks. We strongly and truly encourage lawmakers and agency to continue to solicit the impact of input of the business community, as well as civil society organizations and nonprofit organizations like FPF, as you work to develop these pieces of legislation further. I've sent, we've sent resources to the committee and I'd really be happy to talk about any of these further. And I truly thank you for your time and attention this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I, in, in, I don't know if, if FPF is working um, directly with, um, you, you'd noted maybe a half dozen states at the beginning of your testimony that are um, doing work on AI right now. Um, are there granular recommendations that FPF is making, um, you know, kind of in collaboration and, you know, I'm not sure, I think of you guys as a think tank, essentially, that um, is supporting um, work that maybe some of these um, states are doing. Um, again, th this type of work is um, so nascent in a policy sense that, um, you know, states and legislatures don't have kind of internal resources to affect this type of work. Uh, the state of Vermont created a task force uh, two or three years ago. Um, some technology folks involved in that, some commercial um, folks, some folks with a legal background involved in that task force work, but that was kind of the initial salvo. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we're considering as a state is, you know, potentially having a, a permanent commission in place that looks at these issues from a commercial standpoint, from a government technology standpoint, uh, looking at privacy issues, a whole host of things. Um, so to get to my question, what, you know, one of the things that I think you said in, in the early part of your testimony was essentially be cautious in terms of how you proceed from a regulatory standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and so from a macro sense, that's helpful, but has FPF come up with a, if you're going to regulate, do this, or before you regulate, do this type of recommendation as you're working with states? That's my work, general question. Yeah, our work with states thus far, um, and I personally have worked most with uh, California on um, design and um, recrafting parts of AB 13. Um, We've also had the opportunity to work with Washington State on um, SB 116. Um, and in that context, we've provided some input um, and feedback in terms of what specific forms of regulatory oversight mechanisms may, um, how they may need to be adapted to address not only the reality of um, algorithmic design and uh, cataloging of models and data sets, but also what the what the ideal components might be for things such as impact assessments. Um, as you as you asked, how granular has our advice been? Um, it really has been different per state. Um, so the California bill AB thirteen was quite narrowly tailored to financial instruments and financial organizations use of automated decision systems while Washington state was quite broad. Um, thus our, obviously our advice has, has varied. We're happy to continue to work with um, those states as well as Vermont in order to be able to help you to identify what potential caution points there may be that arise in the regulatory instruments or the regulatory objectives that you have. Um, considering that objectives may change and may um, will likely be what drives the instruments that you choose for regulation. Yeah, and I'll just say, and, and I, I don't recall if you had um, uh, awareness of this before joining us today, we essentially have two bills that um, at, at a high level that we're considering. And one relates to, um, you know, one of the points that you um, talked about, which is, you know, initially you've got to know what you have, you know, from an inventory perspective. And um, one of the bills that's in front of us, it, you know, very specifically relates to that. 
Um, and then the other is much broader in terms of, as I said, a permanent commission. And um, I can't remember if it was testimony we took or some of the feedback we'd gotten from the task force that had been working um, 2019, 2020, um, but looked at a precursor to specific regulation being um, essentially putting in place a code of ethics that people mm -hmm. can uh, comply with or look to as, you know, kind of a North Star of, of how one operates in this field before something more granular like specific regulation is, is put in place. Um, but those were, you know, those were a couple of things that this committee had, um, is, at least is on our radar screen. Yeah. So. In our initial feedback, um, one of the things we noticed is that there are overlaps between 263 and 410, um, but that defin the definition of AI um, was not a point of overlap. And that creating those overlaps so that way there was a little bit more harmonization um, may be an important move to begin with. We recognize that you, uh, were, that you advised including a code of ethics um, and we would certainly have some feedback on how to create mechanisms for um, harmonizing that, not only with the many different forms of AI principle statements that are out there. At last count, there's over 250 um, around the world, but also doing that um, in ways that are conscious of the, the current requirements for, say, professional engineers in their code of ethics and ensuring that those harmonize in a way that is not duplicative um, or is not prohibitive to the way in which engineers need to create these systems. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of hands up from, from members and I'm gonna to go um, to Representative Rogers first. Go ahead, Lucy. Uh, thank you and thanks for taking the time to share some of your expertise with us. I, I had a couple questions, mostly on that part three, the, um, the, the, implementation for oversight of automated decision systems. But I think before I asked, I, I was wondering if you would kind of for our record and, and for the committee and, and watchers on YouTube, just give a little bit more background for us about the future of privacy forum to kind of orient us. I'm not sure everybody necessarily knows, you know, who you are, where you are, how long you've been around, what your overall mission is, if that's, I don't know, maybe I'd ask the chair if that's appropriate at this time. <laughs> okay, so you can thumbs up. Um, so Future Privacy Forum has uh, been around for 11 years. Um, our CEO and founder, Jules Polonetsky, um, is preeminent in the privacy world, primarily um, working on issues of data protection and privacy law early on. This has expanded um, our mission, our divisions, et cetera, have expanded in many ways over the past couple of years. Um, I joined FPF um, in January of 2020 in order to be able to help augment our side for artificial intelligence, um, as well as for review of secondary use of data from researchers and from corporate spaces in order to be able to fuel um, design and development of AI systems, as well as in order to be able to advance overall research goals. Um, our AI team is presently three people, but we have a robust and quite large um, education privacy and education and student data concerns um, division. We also have people who focus um, on the global remit of privacy. So we have offices in the European Union, um, primarily in Brussels. Um, we have experts in European Union legislation, GDPR, et cetera. Um, we have a legislation team that focuses on both federal and state uh, privacy law within the US, as you'll note, that there are many different privacy bills that are coming out this year. So we're tracking all of those. Um, but we also have individuals who are experts in health law and health data. Um, so we are, we are both a, um, we do a lot of policy work, but we do a lot of technology work. Um, one of the ways you can think about it is that we speak both tech and wonk. Um, we, do, we do both sides. But one of the things that is probably most notable about FPF is that we are data optimists. Um, we are typically there to, uh, to try to identify a neutral ground between what is considered to be strong, say, private or corporate concerns and strong um, public or advocacy concerns. 
we started to find some place between those that can be a workable solution for privacy and data considerations. Okay, does thanks. that answer and the question? Yep. It does. I just, I just think it's helpful to have a little background. And where, where are you located? Um, we are in Washington, D.C. That's our home. Um, however, like everyone else, we have in some ways scattered to the winds um, in the last year. Uh, thank you. I, my other question, just um, so, so the part of your verbal testimony that's labeled part three, um, you said you, you basically, you, you talked about some of the challenges of kind of documenting AI, which as you know, is uh, a large part of one of the bills that we have and, and the challenges of even knowing what counts as AI or not. And I guess I, I'm in listening to that part of your testimony, I was wondering if you could share a little bit more. Is that coming from a place of um, kind of your perspective sharing with us that it's more or less a fool's errand or from a place of it is important and, and it is a valuable piece going forward, but just making sure that, you know, we know that it's not necessarily as simple of an undertaking as, I guess, just as if you, from your experience in other states and, and if you could speak to whether you see this as an important piece moving forward or not. Um, it is absolutely an important piece. It is utterly crucial um, for states. It's also crucial for businesses. Um, so. My reflection and why we've included this here actually comes from working with private businesses, um, with private industry, as well as working with states who are trying to identify all of the different systems that they have and how those systems interact with one another in order to be able to build what is either the company's enterprise level AI or the state's well, sort of enterprise um, AI. One of the things that's widely recognized in the AI community is that building model registries is an utterly crucial task to be done um, regardless of where you are. And that includes even in things in research spaces. So as someone who comes to the AI side from a background in computational social sciences, one of the things that I can tell you is always a struggle and is a consistent struggle for people who, with my background, people who use AI as a tool for research, is that oftentimes the models that you are using, you don't necessarily have adequate tracking for them. Um, and that is something that is a consistent challenge for re re reproducibility in research, um, but also for replication and also for ensuring the trustworthiness of the research outputs there. That ports to the enterprise environment, because oftentimes companies may not know exactly which models are being used. There are things that are built into one side that becomes part of another larger model system, which becomes part of another larger model system. Um, and in fact, you can probably think of the way in which most ADS or algorithmic decision systems are built, looks a little bit more like Matryoshka dolls, where there is one small component that's built into one bigger component you may see the overall largest doll um, in the space without necessarily recognizing each of the ones that um, filters all the way down to the smallest system. So absolutely crucial. We recognized, or you know, from my perspective, immediately recognized that that was a strong component of this bill. And I think that that is one unique um, in terms of the legislative landscape, but also two signals that you are um, aware of the uh, of the messy environment that ADS ADS already is. Okay, no, thank you. That's that's really helpful perspective to have. I think also, you know, one of the things that I've become aware of that makes me think this is the right time to be passing this bill is that we don't have a huge number of AI systems right now. So it seems like it could be with with all of the challenges you outlined, it could be a good opportunity to kind of work through some of those challenges where at a time where the number in our inventory might be more like 10 or 20, whereas in a few years, it might be more like 100 or 200, you know? And so just thinking thinking that through is helpful. I guess the my, my final question, um, and then I will turn it over to other committee members, but my, my final question is, did you coming out of that, that paragraph of your testimony about just a, kind of an awareness of some of the challenges this might bring, 
if you had a chance to look over the language of the bill, and I'm not sure if you did, but are there any specific recommendations um, to our language that, that you would suggest to kind of meet some of those challenges? And again, there are certainly areas that I think that we could offer some advice in terms of clarifying the language, um, making that language not only um, harmonized with other either state legislation, pieces of legislation, other forms of discussions of model registries um, that we know exist in the um, in the private industry ecosystem, or even those things that exist um, amongst uh, proposed federal legislation, we're certainly happy to provide that um, that legislative support and tailoring. I think it would take us into um, some parsing of words that I'm not sure that everyone has the endurance to uh, address here. And I know you still have two speakers, um, but I'm very happy to speak with you um, and to work on this offline um, because yes, we do have some, some considerations and advice. Oh, wonderful, thank you. I know, at least I'll speak for myself and, and say I know that I at least would, would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Happy to do so, thanks Lucy. Uh, Representative Sims. Yeah, thank you so much for this testimony, Dr. Jordan. I really appreciate um, seeing our work in this broader national context and get your expertise and perspective on it. Um, I think as our chair mentioned, our current bills focus kind of primarily on setting up a commission um, to provide oversight on this topic and um, looked maybe more narrowly at, you know, government procurement and use of, of AI systems. And so I, I'm particularly interested in hearing maybe a little bit more from you about this question of attending to the needs of the audience and what role, if any, the state might play beyond just our own state government operations around regulating um, sort of the disclosure of when systems, you know, in the private sector are used so that audiences have, um, you know, uh, there's transparent use of technology. And, you know, you, you mentioned these and NIST, um, you know, principles as, as possible guidelines, but would love to just hear more thoughts since maybe we haven't spent as much time thinking about state government role in um, transparency around use of systems in the private sector and our, you know, regulatory um, uh, responsibility or role in, in that situation. Sure, so um, let me start back with the question that you had related to um, procurement and use. So one of the things that I think is probably important here is to realize that governments have that choice of make or buy um, in terms of algorithmic decision systems, just as you have that choice for almost every other thing. Whether or not you've engaged with, um, say, development of these systems as a public-private partnership, perhaps with the University of Vermont or other forms of research institutions, um, determining what sort of transparency requirements you would like to have going forward for these arrangements may be a good place to start. What in the future would you like to see arise as the, the statements, the clarity around the systems that you, that you co-build or that you purchase in the future? And then back, working backwards to identify what it is that you need to know about the systems you, you presently have in use. Um, Identifying whether or not the, um, each of those systems that you presently have in use is used in the way that it was intended, I think is also an important question. Um, is it used for the design that, that you specified in procurement contracts? Um, because one of the things that's interesting about AI and machine learning is it is fluid, it is adaptable, and oftentimes we can take a system from one venue and use it in another. Identifying whether or not that's been done um, and tracing the history of ADS use through the through procurement to, to final use may be a very useful task um, for your commission to undertake. Um, because not only would that show you what it is that you are ultimately interested in using the systems for, but it will also show you um, where it is that future procurement contracts need to focus in order to make sure that future uses of ADS systems are transparent. Um, Requiring disclosure of private systems um, by, by, uh, through public agencies. I'm not sure I completely follow um, where it is that you'd like to, to go with that. Um, perhaps you could provide a little bit more context um, for me to be able to respond to. 
or again, I'm happy to work with you offline in order to be able to, to narrowly tailor that language to the objectives that you have. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, trying to tease out what is appropriate um, oversight by state government and state policy in the private sector, you know, recognizing that, you know, we're just a state within um, a federal landscape and, um, you know, we, we uh, so, um, you know, wanting to kind of understand mm -hmm. what is, is um, what other states are doing in this area um, and appropriate roles for us. And I guess I'm wondering whether, um, you know, some of these suggestions around um, establishing principles that's, you know, um, systems should provide explanations that are understandable to users about when AI is in use. And, um, you know, we, I think I've um, heard other um, testimony around uh, allowing opportunities for um, review of decisions that are made. So if, let's say, I'm applying for a job and my application has been screened by a private company um, using AI, does that company have to disclose that, um, you know, I was denied the job and that decision was made by an automated decision-making system? And, you know, is that something that the state of Vermont should, you know, consider regu regulating, um, you know, or requiring, you know, within our state boundaries? Sure. So there is a lot of activity in those areas that you just mentioned, such as hiring, um, obviously within education, and determining whether or not states would like to take on that role um, is actually a very paramount question. Because while there are um, federal bills that are being proposed, who knows what might happen with them um, to help to track some of these, whether or not the states are going to be the uh, first laboratories of democracy in order to get that done. It seems as if that may be the likely path where state action um, in particular venues is where, is where we learn. Um, so obviously as mentioned, uh, AB 13 in California is tailored towards financial systems um, and automated decision systems there. There's bills in um, other states, for example, in the Northeast that are trying to restrict the use of automated decision systems in hiring. Um, there is a state role that is, per that is tailored to the constituents needs um, within that state for oversight. However, the question of whether or not states wish to take up the expense, whether or not personnel expense, time expense for legislators, time expense for agencies to be able to oversee these systems, particularly in private use is an important question to be asked because this is not likely to be an a, a easy system um, to, to generate. Obviously in your 410 bill, you've already uh, proposed and fairly extensive um, AI oversight, um, AI committee, whether or not that particular committee structure is the appropriate choice for reviewing things like um, private use of ADS systems um, as pertains to the citizens of Vermont, um, that is an important question to ask. One, the last thing I'll, I'll say about this is asking if there are specific and special conditions that are pertinent to the citizens of Vermont where an ADS system is often used. Um, I don't know what that context might be, but asking are there particular things that your constituents are concerned about um, and where ADS systems are used for their particular needs and determining what it is that those citizens will need to know about those systems to be able to appropriately navigate um, with them and or, and or around them, I think is an important first place to start. Paying attention to what's going on in other nations, for example, you mentioned the right to review of decisions, seeing what it is that they, um, comes out for the right to an explanation in the GDPR, um, may be a place for you to, to begin to look to see what the, um, the difficulties or the challenges and what the what the ultimate promise is, um, the, out, the, the final return is on being able to do that um, and seeing whether or not that is where the costs and the benefits um, come out in favor of your state doing that. But again, happy to be able to, to drill down very deeply into what it is that you would like to see, um, you'd like to see regulated um, that pertains to 
to specifically to the needs of the citizens in Vermont. Great, like Representative Rogers, I'd love to take you up on that offer. <laughs> so thank you. Um, Sarah, before we um, move over to, to Charity and Ryan, I, I, I just have a general question about the, um, maybe it's the lobbying, maybe it's the, um, I don't know if, if, if sides are being formed at the national level or at the state level that you're seeing the different states that you're working with. So, um, you know, an analogy we've talked about in this committee in the last month or so was that um, as the internet grew in importance in the last quarter century, um, you know, I think suddenly legislative regulatory bodies woke up I don't know if it was five years ago or more recently that um, there is no regulatory oversight. Um, certainly that's effective. Um, the genie's out of the bottle. And um, right now there's a scramble on some of these issues. Um, and you know, who knows if we're, we'll ever get our hands around them. From an AI perspective and ADS perspective, um, I think some states are trying to get ahead of that right now. So that in 2030, um, there's not the same realization that we had in 2018 um, that we have missed the boat on this. And are there being are there battle lines being formed um, with corporate, let's say, corporate interests from an uh, um, from an ADS um, artificial intelligence standpoint on one side, and maybe you know. This isn't always where the battle line is, but for the sake of this conversation, I'll say with more of a regulatory kind of privacy advocacy group on the other, um, trying to, um, you know, support the, you know, whether it's the privacy interests or, um, you know, the kind of the negative effects that we're concerned about with AI, and there's many positives, but what are those battle lines? Um, who's on one side? and who's on the other. Um, we haven't seen those really start to form in Vermont yet, but I'm guessing they formed already in California. I'm sure that they formed uh, in Washington. And what are the interests on, on either side of those? Because we're gonna see them here. Um, yes, you will eventually see the battle lines being drawn uh, in your state. It is probably easiest to characterize those who are often against um, uh, ADS or AI regulation bills. And it would be very difficult to actually pin down who is encompassed in this because the form of AI that's being discussed um, or the sector in which it's being applied sort of drives who the please don't regulate um, this space, who, who's included in there. But that do not regulate space has a couple of different flavors. Um, one is that regulation, even if it's regulation in the um, in advance of privacy and data protection, sort of a, a minimum form of, of regulation. Um, the argument is that it'll stymie innovation, right? That any type of regulation that you institute will drive tech companies from, from your state borders, um, will drive them from your cities, and you will not reap the benefits associated with having them cited. Um, also, there are uh, some arguments that regulating AI will be impossible. And this speaks to Lucy's question about model registries that we've already built this tremendous ecosystem going back and asking us to trace the provenance and the versions, et cetera, of AI as enacted right now is so difficult and so cumbersome that you would essentially ask for modern life and convenience to stop in order for us to achieve this. Another argument here is that the IP um, the intellectual property loss that would come from um, making visible all of the different training data models, et cetera, um, is so tremendous as it will damage um, the profitability of firms or damage their ability to compete on a global or even national landscape. Um, the third, uh, another part of this is that by increasing regulation, um, by creating any form of regulation, you'll slow down investment. Um, and that in order to be able to spur, say, venture capital um, pouring into artificial intelligence, we must keep it a regulation-free environment in whichever state. Um, and so that is kind of the do not um, side of this. And again, it's difficult to characterize who is all included in this because it does vary by sector and it does vary by state. Um, on the other side of the, the coin of people who are very strongly for regulation, 
um, it often comes from the perspective of do not harm, right? The argument that AI or automated decision systems, algorithmic decision systems, however you uh, characterize them, have caused harm. Therefore, if states wish to prevent harm, particularly to specific populations, um, they must shut down these the uses of these systems almost immediately. Um, other are, uh, sides for the four regulation is that there needs to be um, extraordinary levels of transparency around these systems because offloading the cognitive um, decision making of, made by states, by judges, by um, any number of state officials to, to systems actually displaces the source of legitimacy and authority of the state. Um, that's a little bit more of an academic argument there. And finally, that it is impossible to achieve a satisfactory explanation from these systems as one may do through pursuit of um, appeals in the court system, um, explanation from uh, officers, from agents, et cetera, that you may have ordinarily gotten. So that AI by being used displaces what we expect from, from a state. Those are two poles. Um, they don't necessarily speak the same language. And one of the challenges of crafting legislation will be identifying a middle ground where you're able to speak to both of those sides, um, those who are worried about investment, IP, and innovation, um, and those who are worried about harm, transparency, and explicability, and making sure that we square something um, between those. Thank you, that's helpful for what's coming down the pipe. <laughs> so, um, thank you. I don't see any other hands up right now. Um, and I, uh, so I thank you, Sarah, and, and um, Thanks for being here today. Um, Ch Charity and Ryan, I, I, I want to turn to you um, uh, again to help us through this conversation. Thank you for joining us today from the, from the AG's office. Thank you for having us. Um, I'll just begin by uh, kind of orienting the committee as to where the Attorney General's office intersects with this kind of work. I um, am the Chief of Staff, and as the Chief of Staff, I oversee our legislative work but I also came from the consumer unit. I was an assistant attorney general before I was chief of staff. And that's where I met Ryan Krieger, who is our subject matter expert on this. Um, so let me just begin by listing off some of the ways in which our office deals with privacy or has knowledge about privacy issues, including AI. Uh, the first, of course, is the Consumer Protection Act. Um, and that is an act that we uh, recently um, used to sue an AI company called Clearview AI. I'm not sure if, if you are familiar with that company, um, but uh, Ryan probably can speak more to uh, that case being one of the attorneys working on it. We sued them just, I think that was the last live press conference we did before we went into quarantine last year. So it's been a little over a year since that lawsuit was filed. We also have a couple of other pieces of legislation that are relevant. And, re and as the, the chair pointed out, very recent legislation, one is the data broker registry and the other that comes to mind is the data breach notification act. We see, um, and again, if you are more interested in privacy broadly, um, Ryan can speak to these things, but we of course um, see a lot of uh, issues around uh, data breaches uh, at our consumer assistance program where people are, are calling for assistance with that and getting help with identity theft as a result of data breaches and that kind of thing. Also at our consumer assistance program, we have the small business initiative. So we have worked to educate small businesses in Vermont about um, data breaches and protecting themselves and data that, they're, uh, that they may hold on to from customers or employees. Um, and then shifting gears a little bit, we also have a lot of expertise about discrimination issues um, in our civil rights unit which oversees uh, and deals with um, discrimination in the employment context. So uh, the folks who work there have a lot of knowledge about discrimination in a, in a general sense. And then our um, Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, which is um, located in our criminal division, and, and they work on issues around what was formerly called child pornography and now is known as sexual child sexual abuse material. And they use uh, AI in a very, very limited capacity, which essentially is to um, use uh, images that they have already to 
I quickly identify whether a child who might be in danger is um, located among those images. So they, they actually use that, that technology in this very narrow uh, context. So those are kind of some of the ways that our office intersects with this work. And, and as a result, probably of, of you know, these, all these different areas, we have a subject matter expert in Ryan um, who has been at our office for over 10 years. He literally teaches the class on privacy at UVM in his spare time. Um, is, is really incredibly knowledgeable about um, these issues. So I'm really pleased that, that he's here today and can provide um, more context, more information. We're not here today to weigh in on the bills that you mentioned specifically, but if you would like us to, we can come back later or, or do that in writing, whatever you prefer. Um, but uh, with that, I think I'll just turn it over to, to Ryan and um, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions for him. He's very knowledgeable. So I'm glad that we could be here this morning. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Charity. My name is Ryan Krieger. I'm an assistant attorney general in the public protection division of the attorney general's office. Uh, not to contradict what Charity just said, but uh, I am not a subject matter expert on AI specifically. Uh, it is an area that all of the attorney general community is very aware of and is studying and trying to get up to speed on. Uh, it is an issue with uh, significant consumer protection implications. Uh, but I believe you are probably going to hear from other witnesses who know much more, including the witness you just heard from, who know much more about the actual technology of AI and things like that. I thought that I would give you kind of a higher level overview of some uh, kind of first principles around consumer protection and privacy uh, and a kind of broad overview of what some of the issues are with AI in particular that concern us. And I apologize if, if I'm you know, reiterating things that you already know. But uh, I will just say, you know, the, the big issue with AI that uh, we're concerned about, everyone's concerned about is, uh, well, there are a number, but I think bias is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, government entities, companies uh, want to, you know, they, they want to have consistent systems for making decisions. And... AI uh, often promises the, you know, kind of an objective uh, approach to decision making, which can take bias out of the process. Because we all know that human beings are biased. Uh, we know that there is um, institutional uh, racial discrimination that can kind of be baked into decision makings. So often coming from a very, uh, you know, good place, uh, entities don't want to make biased decisions. So if they can rely on a computer system to spit out a number and say, you know, this is, you know, the course of action you should take, then, you know, they're likely to do that. And I think people are more aware of it now than they used to be. But of course, we're now learning that the AI systems that are spitting out these numbers are often also biased. Now, whether they're more biased than the human beings would have been making the decision in the first place or less biased, or they're just exactly as biased is you know a question that i think a lot of people are are wondering about but you know one of the classic examples which you may have heard or, or if not you'll probably hear multiple times involves a uh, pro publica investigation of a criminal justice algorithm that was used in a number of places but they studied its use in broward county florida and it was basically used for uh determining uh, sentencing recommendations, um, whether to give bail, what level of sentencing to give. And it basically ended up um, incorrectly labeling uh, African-American defendants as high risk at nearly twice the rate of white defendants. And it tended to undercount uh, the likelihood that white defendants would reoffend. And the explanation for this was that generally speaking, the way AI works. Um, and I, I, I attended a conference where at, um, at Harvard Law where they explained that, you know, when you hear the word AI, sometimes it's easier to just think statistics. I mean, basically, you, you have an algorithm that is trying to uh, find correlations between massive sets of data in order to, you know, spit out a, an output. And so AI is generally trained with a training set of data. And if the training set of data has biases baked into it, 
then it is going to spit out a biased outcome. So if you train a, a system that is making uh, criminal justice determinations on a training set in which you know, African-American people tended to get much worse sentences than white people, then it's probably gonna spit out you know, a similar bias. And I suspect that that's one of the big concerns that you know, this committee and, and the state of Vermont has uh, in thinking about our government use of AI. We don't want to make that same mistake. We don't want to you know, have systems that are going to uh, you know, create additional biases uh, like that. And of course, you know, part of the challenge here is again, those using the systems, you know, it, because it's math, because it's a computer spitting out a number, people tend to trust it. Uh, you know, it seems more objective when really it can just be, you know, reissuing some of the same biases that uh, bedevil us all the time. So when we talk about AI, there's um, that kind of uh, decision-making recommendations. There is, it, you know, it's a broad category, facial recognition, falls under AI because you know, machine learning is used to develop facial recognition. Uh, last session, there was a law already passed pretty much prohibiting the use of facial recognition by uh, uh, government entities. Uh, so I think that has been at least dealt with for now. Um, AI is also used for you know, predictive analytics and scoring generally, which is used by uh, marketing companies and advertisers and insurance companies and banks and pretty much everyone uh, to kind of build profiles on individuals. I think from a consumer protection standpoint, this is something that people are kind of worried about. This has real privacy implications. Um, when we passed the data broker law a few years ago, um, we testified about uh, some of the scoring that data brokers do of companies. And we talk about scoring you know, AI is, is part of the, what goes into this. And so companies would score people based on, um, you know, some of the scores were um, um, likelihood to have, to be, uh, to have uh, an addictive personality, um, likelihood to be suffering from dementia. I mean, you know, when you take a large enough data set and you feed it into a computer, you can come up with some, you know, very interesting uh, analyses of people, which, uh, if people knew that these judgments were being made of them, they may feel very uncomfortable with those outcomes. So I think one concern about AI is that it kind of superpowers the ability to uh, kind of get into some of these major privacy concerns around what companies know about us and what they're trying to learn about us. Um, so these are some of the, you know, these are some of the chief concerns, I think, around um, AI. Now, uh, based on some of the conferences I've been to, I think another issue that comes up with AI is um, self-driving vehicles. I don't think that's probably what this, we're too concerned of at this point. So uh, I don't think that's something we need to uh, dwell on too much. Um, but, you know, just, just to speak to, you know, some kind of first principles. So, um, the issue was brought up about definitions and, and how are we going to define this and agreed, you know, definitions are hard. Um, you want to try to get it right. But I would suggest that um, if you do decide to you know, pass law, there will be a lot of discussion about definitions. I'm sure you will be hearing from a lot of the companies that will be you know, directly impacted by such legislation talking about uh, definitions. Uh, when we did the data broker law, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about definitions. Um, Charity mentioned the Consumer Protection Act. This is currently, you know, the, the main law that governs privacy in the United States uh, uh, across the board, right? There are sector specific laws, HIPAA, COPPA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, but the only law that applies to all businesses is Section 5 of the FTC Act or its state equivalent, the Consumer Protection Act. The FTC Act was passed in 1914, and Section 5 says unfair and deceptive acts and practices in commerce are illegal. That's the definition. Okay, what should businesses not do? Unfair things and deceptive things. That's it. That is a law that we have had for over 100 years to, you know, to uh, regulate all of industry. And what? And when that law was initially passed, that was intentional. It was intentionally a very broad definition because the drafters knew that they could not list all of the individual things that a business might do wrong. 
And if they had tried to, they probably would have missed having poor data security. They probably wouldn't have thought to put that in there in 1914, right? So unfairness has kind of worked as a definition going forward. If you think about you know, the other way, if you want to go overly narrow, um, I think that you know, we can all agree that robocalls are a bit of an issue, right? So the main law governing robocalls was passed in, I believe, 1991, uh, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. And that basically put huge restrictions on the use of auto dialers. And it had a very specific definition, a definition which a lot of companies have been able to get around and essentially do robocalling uh, without using something that falls within the definition of auto dialer. In fact, earlier this month, the Supreme Court came down with a decision in which uh, Facebook had been sued for basically sending text messages uh, to people that they did not want. And Facebook was able to argue that the technology it used to create these automated text messages was not an auto dialer, and therefore they could continue to do what they were doing. So um, if you go too narrow or too specific in a definition, it might be a definition that works for exactly how the technology works right now. But uh, first off, the technology will change fairly quickly, and it could even perversely incentivize businesses to adopt technologies that fall outside the definition. This is something we see with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is basically you know, one of the you know, an act that, that, that tries to get to predictive analytics. I mean, your FICO score uh, is basically a predictive analytic that says, what is your likelihood to repay your loans? What is your likelihood to be responsible with your finances? That's all it is. Um, and so the Fair Credit Reporting Act goes after that specific predictive analytic and leaves behind you know, hundreds of other predictive analytics. The same companies that are providing your FICO score are also providing a number of other predictive analytics and intentionally trying to design their businesses so that they do not fall under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, so that they do not have to give notice of adverse uh, actions, and they don't have to you know, do the level of credentialing and all the other things that the Fair Credit Reporting Act requires. So I'm not suggesting uh, you know, that, that you go super broad in your definition. I'm just saying that there, is, there are arguments uh, for being specific, but also for having a definition that is malleable and that can take into account uh, what happens in the future. Um, another uh, thing that I heard is, you know, telling people, you know, give us an inventory of exactly what AIs you're using right now uh, would be a heavy lift because people may not know, right? And absolutely. Uh, but I think we should understand that we are coming into an a, a industry, an area that up until now has been essentially completely unregulated. So there has been no incentive necessarily to have that transparency and certainly no requirement to have that transparency. So of course, there's not going to be that kind of transparency. So I would not argue that you know, we should not try to have more transparency because there is not currently transparency. Right? Um, at one point, companies did not know whether there was lead in their products, including products that went to children, because there was no requirement to know whether there was lead in children's products. And after laws were passed saying, we don't want this anymore, now there were strong incentives for companies to figure out whether there was lead in their products. They may have not known of day one, but they were incentivized to figure that out. And I think that this area is one that would definitely benefit from more transparency. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of uh, the, what I have heard, I, I shouldn't say I think that, um, I've heard advocates argue that companies should have to be more transparent about their data sets, that they should have to be more transparent about how their, uh, their uh, um, algorithms are developed. And there will be arguments on the other side saying that there are intellectual property issues and things like that. But that is something that I think the community may want to consider going forward. Uh, the, the general ethos of consumer protection, I would say, would be more transparency is better. Um, and if there are concerns about uh, intellectual property and things like that, you know, that can be that can be addressed. Um, you know, there are a lot of government entities that deal with very sensitive area banking, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, where there are you know, trade secrets and intellectual property and there are ways with confidentiality 
to be able to deal with you know some of those issues. But I don't think that at this point the committee is considering doing some sort of broad regulation. They're thinking about doing an inventory and trying to figure out, get their hands around the issue, which definitely should be the first step uh, to figuring this out. Now, um, again, our office, uh, especially the Public Protection Division, does not regulate government use of anything. We deal with what is going on in commerce. So we're just giving kind of broad uh, suggestions that we have learned from uh, what we've learned from privacy, generally speaking. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I can talk a little bit about you know, what we've done with the Clearview AI case, which uh, is a, a uh, facial recognition issue. But uh, you know, I'm really here to kind of lend our expertise to the committee, uh, whatever we can help with. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Charity. Um, Representative Sims has her hand up. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, thank you for this, Ryan. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear more about Clearview. You know, again, it's not something that our committee has um, spent as much time on, but I'm very interested in um, this issue of facial recognition and mass surveillance and the implications for, for us here in Vermont. Sure. So uh, Clearview AI is a company that has screen scraped uh, three to four billion photographs from social media uh, all over the internet and created a massive database, which they have applied facial recognition technology to. And by the way, I want to be very careful in what I say here because we are in the middle of an active litigation with Clearview AI. So I'm you know, going to talk about what we have what we have put in our complaint and what has been you know, made available in, in public sources. Um, and uh, we, this came to light uh, because of uh, reporting by uh, Kashmir Hill at the New York Times. A big article came out in January, 2020. Um, interestingly, uh, they primarily came on our radar here in Vermont after they filed in our data broker registry. And um, in the question in the data broker registry that said, do you collect information of children? They said, yes. And that you know, kind of put up a red flag and made us look closer at it. And, and you know, dot, 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 we ended up suing them. Um, we are actually the only state that has sued Clearview AI. Um, we are the only entity in uh, the United States, the only uh, government entity that has brought an enforcement action to date. There have been some class action cases. The ACLU is suing them in Illinois. Other countries have been a little bit more aggressive. Canada has essentially banned them at this point. Um, there are investigations going on in the European Union. England and Australia are teaming up on an investigation. Um, but basically, when the reporting first came out in 2020, it looked like they were going to market this technology pretty broadly. And what the technology actually is, is essentially an app on your phone that you can upload a photo to and it will spit back the photos that it finds in its you know, internet-based database uh, and, and, and kind of links to where those photos showed up. So kind of what this means is you could see somebody walking down the street who you do not know, take a photo of them, upload the photo to the app, and maybe it brings back their LinkedIn profile. So now you know the person. And now you could do a little bit more searching and find out all sorts of stuff about this complete stranger that you've just seen in the street. So you may be able to imagine the potential for abuse of a product like that. Um, and this is a technology which has been possible for a while. Google could have done it. Facebook could have done it. Um, the CEO of Google several years ago kind of famously said, and we cited in our complaint, that they developed this technology and chose not to implement it because of the implications. And the notion of Google not wanting to implement something because they thought it was just too, a bridge too far shows you how much this was a bridge too far. But those uh, ethical concerns did not uh, impact the folks at Clearview AI. Now, I should say that since the litigation has been brought, they have claimed that they have stopped marketing it to private individuals. Uh, they want to limit the sale to law enforcement and to um, private uh, security services, what, whatever that means. Um, shortly after the articles came out, there was a data breach in which uh, uh, their list of consumers, uh, customers were, was leaked 
And it was determined that companies like um, Macy's, the NBA, uh, a lot of companies that you wouldn't have thought would you know, need this kind of security use of, of facial recognition uh, were using it. Interestingly, uh, after we sued, uh, you know, it, it, we were able to, you know, came public that the only state that did not have any law enforcement using Clearview AI was the state of Vermont. Um, and the way Clearview AI had been marketing its product was basically giving out free samples to anyone who wanted it. Um, uh, so a lot of law enforcement agencies, police, state troopers, government agencies, even an attorney general office in another state were using Clearview AI without their leadership knowing that they were using Clearview AI. And with some frequency, we have seen articles come out. Uh, NYPD is discovered to be using Clearview AI and immediately prohibits it. LAPD is discovered to be using Clearview AI and immediately prohibits it. Um, the state of Virginia uh, just uh, issued a statewide prohibition on uh, use of facial recognition, which was um, instituted because one of the legislators discovered that law enforcement in Virginia was using Clearview AI. And so they proposed a bill, which interestingly was passed unanimously, uh, complete bipartisan support for prohibiting um, facial recognition. We of course were ahead of the game on this one. We were actually the first state to prohibit facial recognition across the board, uh, both by executive order and by legislation. So, uh, you know, we, we were ahead of the curve on that one. Um, but, you know, in terms of use of facial recognition by police, you know, our concern there, you know, the argument we've heard is, well, you know, isn't it okay if we, it's just used by police? And, you know, our office's response is no, it's not, uh, for a number of reasons. One, um, the way Clearview has been providing it has just been irresponsible. Uh, no guardrails around the use of the technology. In fact, there was a marketing email that went out in which they recommended that users go wild with the product, just search on whoever they want to. And these are police officers who are supposed to be using the product for very specific uses. If police officers are giving licenses to this without their offices even knowing, then they have a very, very powerful tool, which you know, there wasn't any sort of controls over and Clearview did not seem interested in, in implementing those kinds of controls. Um, and this is kind of, you know, writ large what the issue with privacy is in general, which is to say that, you know, techie's going to tech, right? They're going to build stuff that is cool and that, you know, stretches the limits of what is, is possible. And that's great. We want companies innovating. We want them doing that. But they're not necessarily thinking of the privacy implications and the ethical implications. And frankly, the market um, incentives don't encourage them to do that. Um, you know, they, there's venture capital to be had if you can come out with something for which there's a market and which people will pay money for. Um, and, you know, and the reason we're in this position is because we do not have any sort of privacy regulatory structure in place to say otherwise. So companies are going to kind of run ahead of the curve and they're going to develop this stuff um, until someone can come back and say, you know, no. And, and we're, in a, we're in a very reactive mode right now. We have to wait until the thing happens and then becomes public. And then we have to say, no, 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 you shouldn't have done that two years ago, which is hard to do now that it's kind of, you know, embedded, you know, now there's maybe hundreds of law enforcement agencies using the product and they're saying, oh, but now everyone's using it, this thing, which maybe we shouldn't have built in the first place. And that's, that's where we are right now. That's why it's so important to have some sort of private, you know, broad privacy regulation, whether it's at the state level, the federal level, so that we can get ahead of these issues. Uh, before they kind of become embedded uh, and give that argument. And, and arguably, you know, a lot of the uh, privacy practices that we see right now that, you know, started 10, 15 years ago, if we had known 10, 15 years ago that they were going to do what they're doing now, we probably would have said, oh, no, no, that's, you know, that we, we have an issue with that. But there's been this kind of slow creep that we have been very late in, in, in discovering, it's been very opaque. And so now we're here and you hear, well, the horse is already out of the barn, it's already out there. So, you know, so you like to regulate. And it's like, well, no, I mean, you know, I mean, people were hiring children for labor for hundreds of years before we said, no, this is wrong. You know, you're gonna have to change your business practices, sorry. So, I mean, we're only about 15 years in here. 
Um, so it is not too late to say, we don't like the trend. We don't like the way this is going. And, you know, if you want real, not scare tactics, but really understanding where this could go, you could look at how this technology is being implemented in some other countries with more authoritarian regimes to see some really scary stuff of what uh, the, the worst case scenarios. I mean, it's, you don't have to speculate about this stuff. I mean, it's already being implemented in some countries. And so, you know, that's, that's what we're here for to, to head this stuff off before it, it goes too far. Um, Ryan, thank you for that overview. And um, some of the things you touched on, I think, are some of the things that the legislature will um, also be wrestling with in terms of there are a few institutions that are more siloed, unfortunately, than the Vermont legislature. But in terms of some of the commercial aspects of this, some of the constitutional privacy aspects of this, um, in spite of this committee's uh, title, we actually really only have jurisdiction over technology as it's used within state government. So it's not, you know, kind of broadly speaking, technology and society or the commercial aspects of technology. Um, so one of the bills that we're looking at, H-263, is very specific about the inventory of um, technological systems and ADS used in state government. Um, we've had testimony from the Agency of Digital Services there are somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 software systems that, um, that the state employs. I think 1,200 was the, was the number, but it's, I think it's, that's a rough number. Um, and also that, you know, to the extent that they've been identified, um, automated uh, decision systems and artificial intelligence really is only employed in a, in a pretty small number of those. So at this juncture, the sense we have is that it's much better to, to get our arms around this inventory now, as opposed to three years from now, when um, this type of software will be expanding geometrically. Um, but the thing that I wanna bookmark for the Attorney General's office is that um, there's, a, there's a part of um, H-263 from an inventory perspective that looks at whether the automated uh, decision system makes decisions affecting the constitutional or legal rights, duties, or privileges of a Vermont resident. Um, and then I think later in the bill, it talks about um, uh, you know, other issues related to legal rights, um, duties, and privileges of folks impacted. And you know, I, th there's questions as to whether the Agency of Digital Services has kind of the, the, you know, the capacity to make you know, some of that assessment. And to the extent that the AG's office might be involved in, you know, directly looking at some of this, um, you know, some of these software systems that we currently employ in the state, again, to look at what are the constitutional issues at play here, um, or how do these affect the legal rights of citizens of the state of Vermont. Um, so the question of how do we want the Attorney General's office involved in looking at these things? Do we want to replicate or make sure that those resources are available in the short term or the long term in the Agency of Digital Services? Is it important that we have those capabilities involved in what type of technology we use in state government so that those legal kind of, you know, constitutional um, issues related to discrimination, that we have those front and center? Um, so that, that's more of a human resource question that I think we've got to make in state government. But I just want to bookmark that as that's something that's in this bill and that we might be, you know, further reaching out to the AG's office as to how do we assess those things? And do we need to pull the AG's office in as, um, you know, a resource in state government to, to taking a look at and assessing those things? Because frankly, I don't think we have that capability at the Agency of Digital Services at the, at the moment. So that's just a, a flag I want to put up. Um, Representative Chase, did you um, have a question? I did. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ryan. Um, you mentioned a couple of things that, like with the uh, auto dialers um, having legislation that's too uh, narrow and prescriptive, uh, and with Clearview perhaps being a little bit behind the ball, having a, a legislation that may be a little too broad and uh, doesn't exactly keep these companies from doing unethical things or whatever. Um, 
from your position, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on how we can tread that line, uh, perhaps to what degree uh, legislative intent in the beginning of bills uh, creates a structure by which um, a court could look at a, a situation and say, okay, so this particular situation wasn't identified two years ago, but it is clearly against the intent of what was being sought. Um, I, I would suggest that legislative intent certainly uh, is is uh, important uh, to consider, but from a, a legal standpoint, it's kind of like the last ditch backstop. You want the language of the bill to say what the bill should be. Legislative intent comes in when the language is really you know so confusing to the courts that you know they have to go to some other source. Uh, you know the plain language is is what they're going to look to first. If you want a law that is going to kind of get ahead of the issue, I think it makes sense to have a law that, you know, kind of is based on principles, is based on, you know, kind of broader notions of what, you know, should or should not be done. I'm not suggesting that, you know, we necessarily adopt GDPR. I'm not suggesting anything one way or the other. But GDPR is an example of a law that really just lists very broad principles, you know, an enormous, you know, number. Uh, it, it does not try to go too into the details, which I think has caused an enormous amount of frustration from the business community. Uh, so that, you know, is the downside. And it's also a very broad sweeping law, but, you know, it does try to get at everything. In fact, it has a section on artificial intelligence, um, article uh, 22 of GDPR. Uh, the data subject shall have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profile, which produces legal effects concerning him or her or similarly significant effects, similarly significantly affects him or her. So broad, just, you know, that's, that's the statement. And then, you know, there are some, some other, you know, language in there, but so, you know, GD, you know, as far as the law in Europe, Right, which a lot of companies here already have to comply with, there is this kind of uh, trying to address AI. Um, well, again, not, not, you know, our office does not have a position one way or the other on whether that's the way to go about it. But um, it, you know, I think it does make sense to kind of try to get ahead of it. I mean, there's kind of, I think there's, there's a couple different uh, ways you could go about doing that. One would be to have the, a law that you know, has those broad principles. And another would be to have some sort of um, equivalent of the data protection authority that each country in the EU has, which California's latest law actually creates an equivalent of a data protection authority in California. Um, interestingly, the city of uh, Portland, uh, I understand, has a commission which has to approve any Portland government use of anything that might have privacy implications. I don't know that any other government entity has created something similar to that, but that's kind of another model to potentially look at. You've talked about having a commission that will look at AI. Maybe that's, you know, obviously these are um, very uh, resource intensive solutions, but at the end of the day, you know, these things are going to have to, um, you know, have people with dedicated resources and expertise to look at them. That said, we do already have kind of an ad hoc way of addressing these things. Um, you know, during COVID, I was pulled into meetings to when they were talking about contact tracing and what might be the privacy implications of contact tracing. So, you know, we, you know, this is what we all do here in state government is, is we lend a hand, you know, even if, though it, you know, uh, health and, you know, AHS is not my area, you know, we all help each other out where, where we can. And so I, I think that you know, the office, if there's a legal analysis to be done, you know, someone in the office, whether it's uh, GCAL or consumer protection, you know, will, will lend their expertise. If it's such an overwhelming thing that these things have to happen every day, now it becomes, right, kind of a resource issue and, and, and maybe a new uh, position has to be created, a new uh, uh, FTE. Thank you. And that's uh, Portland, Oregon, Maine, or one of the uh, other? Oregon. Oregon. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sarah, Charity, Ryan, thank you all for being here with us. I really appreciate your time, and uh, we we might we likely will be reaching out to you in the future again. But um, you know, as we kind of table set for you know the work that we're doing to um, craft a piece of legislation, this is um, this is really helpful, fundamental information. So appreciate your time.
Um, for members, I think we're going to take a three minute break before we start our 1031 hearing just for your good lumbar health. <laughs> 